message people to give up all the information about who they, who they are, where they are, what they're doing, who they like, who their friends are, um, and they just come along and, and suck it all up. And, and yeah, yeah, there is that distinction, of course, between what the government can do and what the, what the, what the corporate companies can do. But of course, in the end, Corporate companies have collected all this information about us that we have willingly handed over. Mm. Um, it isn't that hard for the government then to just knock on the door of the big companies and say, right, would you like some of that, please? Give it to us. So when you do create these mega databases, in a sense, of course it doesn't matter who has them, but in another way, it doesn't matter that much because it's never that hard for the government to get them. You know, some of the things, that, the examples that you use in the book, uh, the ways that data is collected, these surveys, these harmless games and surveys that they take online, and I've seen them, which beetle would you be, what kind of cheese would you be, and you, you take the, the survey and, and uh, they seem harmless enough, but those are all, that's data points, right, that's a collection. Yeah, I mean, and you know what, that's very, very valuable data points, yeah, it's sort of, yeah, what movies are you, and, 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 and we, a lot of us over the years have built those things in, and one of the most infamous was essentially finding out what sort of personality you had. So I remember these surveys, 2013, 2014, a lot of surveys saying, find out your personality type. And you'd answer a sort of standard survey question, uh, questionnaire, uh, and it would work out whether you were neurotic, whether you're open-minded, whether you're conscientious. And it would then give the results back to you. And everyone thought, brilliant, this is wonderful. But behind the scenes, thousands of people completed these surveys, hundreds of thousands. But behind the scenes, they found it. We're then working out the relationship between your personality type and the things you'd like on Facebook. So we're able to build a model of what sort of people like what sort of things on Facebook. And that is what was then used by Cambridge Analytica and other companies to build profiles of people's personality. And so, yes, yeah, a good piece of advice here, George, for anybody who is thinking about filling in one of those supposedly harmless surveys might actually be giving away a lot more about themselves than they think. Uh, this scenario of government surveillance on the present uh, Big Brother is, is scary enough. Uh, more frightening still, though, is the prospect that you explore in this book about government being replaced, that big data becomes big government. Uh, and that's, whether it's utopian or dystopian, uh, you know, that is that is uh, not out of the realm of possibility. Well, it's, it's the kind of, it's the importation, the wholesale importation of big data technology, these, these techniques and uh, how by So working out where policing resources should go, and which people should be hired for certain posts, you know, what sort of strategic military decisions should be taken, more and more of those sorts of very important decisions being taken by machines. Because they're making worse decisions necessarily, but in, in often cases because they're making better decisions. Um, but the problem then is it's very hard to hold those machines accountable in the way we can hold humans accountable. Uh, a government official makes a bad decision, or discriminates against someone, makes a huge error of judgment, or whatever it happens to be, there are, there are ways that we're able to hold them to account. When it comes to a black box doing the same thing, we don't really understand how it works. We don't know who's to blame if something goes wrong. Uh, we don't know how to hold those decision makers accountable. And, and this, I think, is going to be a really, really important challenge for citizens in the year ahead. How do we maintain accountability in an age of powerful machinery? Uh, you make some uh, interesting comments about the, these big data companies, Google and Facebook, and the, the giants, the giants in our uh, world economy now, who, and you know, they're all, they grow up in Silicon Valley, they uh, have a fun workplace, they dress uh, casually, and they're all kind of almost counterculture uh, type figures and rebels and individuals, and, and the reality of, of, of where the companies are going is, is much different than that. Or am I just misstating? Well, no, there is there is a strange. Uh, yeah, I think it's been a very uh, it's been a very 
bit weird to find that because these uh, big companies have, of course, always positioned themselves as being countercultural. Yeah, out of the 1960s, countercultural, we're different, we're not the man, we're not the establishment, we skateboard to work, we wear t shirts, we're not in a suit like these boring old businesses. And I think, and then, of course, we have our sort of socially progressive right on views. And I think that has, for a long time, obscured the fact that they are just sort of ruthless businesses just like any other. Um, and it's only recently I think people have realised that uh, just because you wear a t-shirt to work doesn't mean you can't be, uh, can't be a very tough-minded, hard-nosed business as well. And in a strange way, I think that might be uh, coming back to haunt these companies because for a long time it helped them, but I now think people don't like hypocrites. And so when they preach, um, we're just here to save the world, we're not really a business, we're a social project, we're trying to improve people's lives and making money is purely coincidental to that mission. I think if you say that and then you don't do that, then be prepared to deal with the rough of people, frankly. And that's I think, kind of part of why we have this big tech backlash going on at the moment. You know, I don't remember you mentioning this in the book, uh, but I wondered about DNA databanks. You know, the, the Ancestry.com, the folks who, hey, we'll tell you your genetic breakdown, where your ancestors came from, that kind of thing. Uh, people willingly give that up. I don't know how that fits into the overall picture, but uh, can you address that? That's very interesting. Yeah, I, I, I did think about that because I was focusing a lot more on, on, on specifically on data points, you know, digital data. But, um, of course, they are data too. Uh, I guess, generally speaking, two quick things on this. The first is that uh, the, 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 there is a huge surge of excitement and interest in data collection about health records, about your health. Uh, this is big business now. All the big tech firms are getting into this. They want to understand your health because they, they know that using data to try to predict illnesses is going to be a very big money spinner in future. Some people think it's the, the big data in health is going to be as important as the invention of penicillin. And antibiotics in terms of improving our, our life. So more and more is going to be about your physical health. And it wouldn't surprise me if, uh, if DNA databases are in some ways part of it, I guess. The big lesson, the kind of, the lesson I've learned over the years, when I used to be very optimistic about all of this data, and I still am, in the way that it can help our lives in certain ways. Uh, but I now, I now color that optimism with a, with a nervousness about being very, very aware of who's getting this and what they might be doing with it. Will they be able to exploit it for commercial reasons? What are the long-term consequences of building up these massive databases about all of us? Because, you know, the, the experience of the last 10 years or so shows that, it, it, that there are risks to all of this that we haven't really thought about. Well, I, I, you know, I can't believe I'd say this, but I'm almost more worried about uh, humans having all that than just an AI or something. It, machines who could, could rule the world might make decisions based on unemotional, logical uh, reasons, and the humans uh, might certainly be more inclined to have ulterior motives. Well, yes, but of course, what, you, what you're really going to be talking about here is machines that might be able to give the appearance of being unemotional and, you know, you know very rational and but, but, but controlled by humans and controlled by powerful humans. So, who will be able to take that power, that data and that information and decide exactly how it is used. So, the thing to worry about when you're, I think, imagining about, the, you know, machine taking a more and more decisions in our lives, it's, that's one thing, but who owns that machine? How can we be sure that whoever owns that machine isn't tampering with it and making sure it spits out the answers that they want? So I think it's, uh, I think, any time there's a machine, there's usually a human somewhere that is behind it who, who runs it, and, and you've got to keep an eye on who that person or those people are. We're talking with... Yeah, I guess that's been the case with, with some of these properties. 
Yeah. Uh, we are looking at a Supreme Court case this week. Uh, several states want to uh, make online retailers start uh, making, I guess, consumers pay sales tax, uh, even though they may live in a state where they don't have it.